very pleased to uh, welcome Stephen Woods and Vernon Friesen fr from Google. It occurred to me that there are, uh, there are three sort of connecting things that through at least a number of our speaker here, speaker here today, speakers today or in this symposium, one of them is the, the David R. Cheriton School of Computer Science at the University of Waterloo. Another one is Google, and a third one is the Prairies, which I think all three of the speakers, and one tomorrow, um, and to a, to a weird extent myself, all have a connection to the center, to the cold center of Canada. Um, Steve Woods uh, is the director of engineering for Google uh, in Waterloo. Uh, he received his PhD in 1997 with Chang Yang here, uh, I believe in constraint satisfaction, is that right? So he went on to, uh, to found quack.com and NeoEdge systems, I think, and then moved back to the Waterloo region. He became part of the anti-brain drain to, to back, back to Waterloo and, uh, and has been the, the director of engineering at Google since around 2011, do I have that? Eight. 2008. To eight, okay. Um, and um, this, the, the, wait, what, what's the Prairie University, Prairie Connection University of Saskatchewan for his undergrad. Right. And uh, Verna Friesen also is at Google, engineering manager at Google, also at NeoEdge Systems prior to that, and also at the University of Saskatchewan prior to that, followed by a master's degree at the University of Waterloo. And we're very pleased to have both of them here today and uh, look forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you for having Thanks. us. It's nice to be here. Very nice to be here. <clears throat> so. Uh, uh, I took uh, time to put together a new talk for this, so I'll be reading liberally as opposed to entertainingly, like David's talk was uh, very good, because uh, this meant a lot to me to, uh, to, uh, to be here at this event at this great anniversary, uh, I think for both of us. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, my grandfather also came to a homestead in Saskatchewan, so the connections continue to flow. Um, but uh, we're not here, as David was, to talk about the way software is developed at Google with monkeys in cages. Um, but rather, I'm, I'm here to talk a bit about the community, uh, in particular how Waterloo, the University of Waterloo, uh, originally formed my idea of community and how that's led me uh, back, uh, and, uh, and Verna from her own story, back repeatedly to this community. And, and we're going to conclude with some thoughts about what the future might look from our point of view in this community. So like many of you, this university has a special place in my heart, and over the years has become a very defining and constant um, point of reference for my work, for my personal life, my friends, my community, and also now my family. Um, it's a little hard to imagine that there's been 50 years of computer science at this location, actually. It's a little staggering. <laughs> it makes you look back uh, a little bit on your age, uh, right, Tim? As, uh, Tim was like a lab assistant at U of S when I was there in undergrad, so it's, I've known him forever, it seems like. Um, and when you think of it, I've had a 28-year relationship with this university, which is more than half of the period of time that the school, the school in its various forms has existed. Um, and so I'm going to reflect a little bit on how I got here, because I think that's a really common thread for many of us, is how we came to Waterloo and how we chose to stay. And this has become an increasing theme as our community has grown and, and the companies around it have become more complicated and large. Um, so I came, as was mentioned, from a small town in Saskatchewan, and I grew up uh, doing what you do in those kinds of towns, which is uh, largely hockey and whatever else happens to be on television. Um, but along the way, I learned to, to write software when I was young, um, thanks to the encouragement of my parents. Um, and uh, while there was, it was very hard at that time to connect uh, thoughts about career uh, and school, they didn't really fit together. There was no good advice. Maybe there's still no good advice. I'm going to come back to that. About what uh, the math you take in school, how it might connect to a career, how computers themselves might connect to careers. They were fun and interesting for me, um, but I really had no understanding of how that might lead to a career in either academics or business at all. Um, I had tons of passion at that time for teams, and I didn't really understand how that might connect to my life, um, which it has very much, into sport, community, family, and friends in small town. Uh, but again, none of, no connection for how teams might fit in with software, um, no idea about how that idea of working in groups might uh, apply. Uh, to uh, software development and, and working in cages of monkeys, um, which is going to be a recurring theme. I cannot get this out of my head. Um, I was always mathematical. I was a self-taught software developer, as I mentioned, by 15, including machine language. Specifically, I was writing uh, code on a VIC-20 that uh, somehow somebody gave me. Um, 
And uh, that was interesting, and that got me started on a, on a thought process of what I would at least put to in university. So I, in my theme, I'm going to talk about the best problem I spent working on in that time period of my life um, and a realization from each of these themes. So my best problem that I worked on was I created Space Invaders in 3.5K of memory, um, largely by reprogramming the character set because there wasn't enough memory. And I had to learn machine language because the language itself that was available was unusable. So I think this is an interesting theme, actually, with the talk today. And I realized that computers were fun and I should continue to do things with computers. I went to University of Saskatchewan after that and I had no idea what I would do. I went to a general degree in math and science um, because I like math and that seemed like a good idea and I thought I would take computer science because it was easy. So I did that, um, but at the time I wasn't even familiar with the idea of a program in computer science. I uh, wasn't even aware that there really was one. Um, and what they did at U of S at that time is they took everybody who was in introductory computer science as part of uh, the, the math program and they sort of made us sit, I guess, the same um, a first midterm, um, and everybody who did well in that was basically shunted into computer science, which was a great idea, really. I had no idea I was now a major in computer science, and I've never really managed to get that changed. And um, so it was true, we were all put in a major in computer science, and away we went. And after that, you started to learn how much fun it was. I had great professors at that university, um, some pretty good lab assistants and grad students, uh, Tim, of course. Um, but again, I had no connection between this theory and the work we did really to how it would be a career. I really didn't understand how things worked uh, in the real world. Um, and I didn't understand how computers at all could be used to change the world. I had no understanding of this, I think, at all. Um, and again, still no connection of leadership, team building, roles in the software, but we started to build software in teams a little, just a little bit. Um, during that time, I was trying very hard to get Verna to be on my team. She wouldn't let me be on her team. She was too good for me. Um, She's never been able to get off the team since, but uh, <clears throat> around 1987, I was coming up to graduation and I wasn't sure what I was going to do for a living at all, um, but I was encouraged by a favorite professor, Rick Bunt, um, to come to Waterloo. I'd never heard of Waterloo. Um, I was from Saskatchewan. You didn't go to Ontario. It wasn't done. Um, it was certainly it was frowned upon in my family, certainly, um, for very historic reasons involving like energy policy and things like that, which you would recall. Um, but at any rate, there's Waterloo's reputation, 1970, 1987 in Saskatchewan, where you have professors, top grade I, former IBM professors saying, you know, Waterloo's for you. Um, it's interesting. And uh, I put that aside because I wanted to make money. So I took my job for $26,000 a year at SaskTel um, and started writing software professionally, if that's what that was. Um, and uh, it was just a horrible, horrible experience. Really, really one of the most horrible experiences of my entire life, um, where I was thrown into an environment of broken systems. Uh, so all of, really, I really wish I'd heard this talk from David before this. Um, weak software developers, weak managers, and absolutely no vision for where the project should go. And so I realized that wasn't really going to be for me. The best problem I worked on in that period of my life was I wrote a typing tutor in PDP on a PDP 11 using assembly language. Probably the most fun I had in a long time. Once again, Verna was on a different team, so mine broke. Um, the worst problem was. Um, trying to redesign and rewrite an inventory tracking system at SaskTel, which would have been probably several million lines of code and horribly written, as I said. And the realization was that I had to do something different with my life. Hi, I'm Verna. Um, like Steve, I grew up in Saskatchewan, mostly in small towns. That's what all those little elevators up there are about. Um, my parents were both teachers, so quite a bit different than Steve. Um, they started out teaching in a two-room school. Um, yes, my grandparents all came and homestead in Saskatchewan too. Um, and we moved quite a bit when I was a kid. So I, in my first eight years of school, I think I was in eight different schools. Um, and that, I think, played a lot into, into how in my, I was you know, evolved over time. Um, and then we moved to uh, Prince Albert, uh, which was in the north, and that's where I learned to love hockey. Um, and that's what that Raiders thing is there, Tim. And uh, that's also where I graduated from high school. Um, my dad was a high school physics, chemistry, and math teacher. Um, and my favorite thing to do was just to mark exams with him. He would do multiple choice exams, and he would let me, as a 10-year-old, mark them. And I loved it. <laughs> I know, right? And um, but this was definitely it. Definitely shaped how I thought about math and science. It seemed really accessible. Um, it seemed like something fun and interesting, and something I definitely wanted to do. Um, so then I got a chemistry set for Christmas when I was ten, um, and there was really no turning back. I was in love with math and science. Um,
um, my high school in Prince Albert didn't have a computer science class, but I enrolled in every other math and science class that there was, and uh, I just, I loved them all. Um, and I did really well in them. So I won the science award in my grade 12 graduating class. Um, and I also got the governor general's nomination for my school. Um, and at that point in my life, I believed I could do just about anything. So when it came time for university, I was really torn though. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I loved chemistry, obviously. Um, I had a grade nine to, uh, in piano and I thought maybe music was my future. And then I also liked archeology span and uh, linguistics. Everything sounded interesting. Um, so what I did was I started by studying chemistry and I decided I would do that, see where it led. Maybe I would do an engineering degree eventually, although my mom really didn't want me to go into engineering. Um, but I was also interested in this computer science thing. My brother had bought a computer and was programming. It seemed really cool. Uh, that sounded fun too. So as required in uh, first year at University of Saskatchewan, I had to go talk to an advisor when I signed up for my classes. And um, so I went to this advisor and I, I actually drove from Camrose, Alberta to Saskatoon to have this appointment. And um, and I told the guy I wanted to do a major in chemistry and I wanted to take computer science as one of my sciences first year. And he was like, no, you don't. It's really hard. Computer science is really hard. It's cutthroat. You don't want to take it. And I, I just, I got really angry. I was like, what? Doesn't he know I can do anything? Um, he hasn't seen my high school grades. What's wrong with this guy? Um, so I was definitely going to defy his, his advice. And uh, I enrolled in computer science first year uh, with a major in chemistry. Um, but by about the first term, as Steve said, we took this midterm. And um, I was in the, in the uh, I guess, the stream for majors. And I took the midterm and I loved it. And then the midterm at, you know, at, at Christmas was even better. I think I got 100 and I was like, this is, this is where I belong. What am I doing in chemistry? Um, chemistry was getting boring and uh, computer science was getting more and more interesting. So I switched majors and my intro intuition proved right. I was really good at it. Um, the course material also kept getting more and more interesting. Um, I distinctly remember Rick Bunt's OS class where we all got up and acted out page swapping algorithms, yeah. which yeah. was the most fun ever. If you teach OS class, you should definitely do that. Yeah. And um, I, was the, I was just enthralled with the beauty of, of, of protocols, um, you know, like uh, the slotted aloha for some reason stuck in my head as this beautiful Hawaiian thing. Um, but it was also had a beauty of its own, right? So, you know, the simple yet elegant solutions that there were to all these hard problems were fascinating to me, and I was sure there were a lot more of them out there. Um, so for two, no, three summers, um, when I met Tim, I worked in the Department of, of Computer Science in Sask at the University of Saskatchewan doing NSERC research. And um, then in 1987, I graduated with high honors from uh, with this computer science degree, obviously. And I was also valedictorian of my class, which I often forget, and Steve reminds me. Um, and shortly after that, I got my first real programming job at SED Systems, which was doing some work with uh, satellite companies and telemetry systems. Um, and similar to Steve, it was a, it was a horrible experience. Um, so back to you. <laughs> So that, I think those are probably pretty typical entry stories to the University of Waterloo. Um, people come here looking for something different and, and this is what I'm gonna get into. When I came here 28 years ago, um, I can't even begin to explain how different it was from my previous experiences. It was like the best out of box experience, like buying a new iPhone or something. Oh, wait a minute, not iPhone, a Pixel. Um, but um, it was really just a tremendous experience. I, I immediately um, had an, an amazing array of faculty, students, friends, people who were interesting, people who were encouraging, who wanted you to be part of their group. It was just a, a really tremendous thing. It was also challenging because of that. There were so many things to do. The first person I met here, I think, was Dr. Tompa. Uh, I may not remember that. There's been a lot on your, over your years. But uh, I, he was the first professor I met um, when I sat down, and that was reasonably intimidating. So at any rate, um, I became a quickly a part of the UW community in, in lots of ways. Uh, I ended up finding uh, Dr. Chung Yang as my supervisor who uh, became a very deep collaborator in research for many, many years, um, even while I was long gone into industry, and then eventually became a really close friend of mine for, for all of these years still today. But I think that's really interesting, those connections. You hear them all the time when you talk to people from Waterloo. 
they come, they connect with a professor, um, they connect with other students, and they maintain these relationships for a very long time. I think it's really interesting. Um, I started uh, at that time to see how it was possible to do collaboration and research for the first time. I spent about one hour every Wednesday for years, a couple, seemed like at least a couple years, with uh, Chung um, learning how to actually collaborate on a whiteboard. This is an enormously new skill for me, but it, it uh, really opened up my life uh, in many ways. Um, many of those people are in the room, so a lot of them that I've met over those years, whether it's on the hockey rink, uh, computer science profs, sports, athletics, warrior athletics, etc. My best problem at the time that I got a chance to work on was improving an engine for constraint solving that uh, was first built at MIT, and it was a great um, accomplishment, I think, working on that with uh, a number of other researchers to make that happen. And my worst problem was I still had not the slightest idea what I wanted to do. Um, at, that, at that time, though, I did realize a couple things, that the master's work I had done, just generally speaking, not, and also the specific work, but just generally the skills I'd learned here, um, led to enormously better career opportunities. <laughs> I guess this isn't too surprising, but it was quite a surprise to me. And all of a sudden, there were a lot of opportunities to do. And it dawned on me then that problems, ideas, collaborations, and software could be the basis for more uh, potentially actually in the business world. All right, so how did I end up at UW? Um, well, there were many influences, starting with my professors at the University of Saskatchewan, who convinced me that I should apply for an NSERC, even though I had no intention of going to grad school. Uh, they were optimistic that I would change my mind and I should keep my options open. They probably knew more about the work environment I was going to enter than I did. <laughs> um, and then Steve talked me into applying to grad school. Uh, he actually tried to get me to apply to MIT mostly so he could say he had a friend at MIT. Um, but they were all right. By the time the acceptance letters ca started coming in, I was ready for a new challenge. And so um, I decided to go to grad school. But why UW? So I applied to a bunch of places. Um, and I was reflecting about this. I, there are three main reasons why I came here. Uh, the first one was my family. My sister was doing a PhD here in psychology. My parents decided to semi-retire and move here. Um, and that was just really attractive. The second was funding. Um, UW was offering me a lot more money than other places. There was this thing called a fellowship. There was TAs. And then on top of the NSERC and the you know, the free housing with my parents. So that, that was convincing. And then there was the program. And for whatever reason at that time, I had this perception that at UW I could get a really practical degree. Um, in my head, uh, Toronto was all about, you know, theoretical problems I wasn't interested in. And uh, UW had this great research uh, in practical things that I wanted to learn about, which at the time was high-speed networks. Um, so first, how, what was my experience like? The first thing was I had this great research group. Um, Johnny Wong was my uh, supervisor, and I really lucked out there. He was passionate about his work. He was uh, a great mentor, a really good technical advisor, an encourager, and he, um, he and I worked really well together. I distinctly remember him telling me that this was the best time in my life, and there were two things I should make sure I did. One was really enjoy it, and the other one was Take my time, don't rush. Why would you rush through the best time of your life? Um, so that had a really big impact on my, the way I looked at grad school, but also the way that I could embrace failure as a path to learning, because I wasn't in a hurry, right? And um, so, so not only did I fail and then say, oh well, I have you know, many more months left, it's fine, um, but I also, uh, he would, you know, he would always say, do you have time for a meeting or is that baseball game this afternoon, right? Like, I should go out and I should, inter I should mingle with all the other grad students. And so at the end of this time, I sure I had a new shiny degree, but I also had um, lifelong friends and contacts and also a relationship with this or, um, academic community that was going to last for, well, like, till now and hopefully longer, actually. Um, so I, I do want to say, though, that I haven't been reading the things about the impact and influences, because I think you can read them. But the courage to take risks was, was a big deal, and I think something that I really learned here. Back to Steve. <clears throat> so they say you don't appreciate a place until you leave and return and leave and return and leave and return again. So I've done that. Um, I took my research and I went away to government research labs in Australia and then back here in Canada in Quebec actually, which is definitely not on the plan if you live in Saskatchewan, but uh, I eventually made up with my father. Um, and I spent a lot of time writing software professionally, but always in my research area. It turned out that was very well a good time for spatial constraint reasoning, um, still is actually, but I did a lot of work in that during that time. But I started to realize more and more as I went different places that my identity was heavily rooted in my relationships here in the work I did here, in my pride for this uh, 
institution and for the way I think that uh, Dr. Yang had taught me to do research. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, I felt something was missing when I was away. I returned here to do my PhD in 1993 um, because I felt there were some significant things I could do by spending time uh, in a dedicated three-year kind of sprint. Uh, three years is, in fact, a sprint, but it seemed like it was, um, to get some things done. And we accomplished a lot in that time. And again, I learned new skills. I was off organizing conferences. I was off pu uh, you know, public speaking, um, which isn't coming off that great today, but typically I learned that skill. Um, at that time, where I had to get over the idea of talking in front of a lot of people, you've all done it, but for me it was absolutely terrifying the first time I had to do it, um, and I think I've not managed to get through that. Um, and again, this is a lot of interesting things all of a sudden. Now I'm organizing groups, I'm working in teams, collaborating with people, writing papers, writing books. It's a lot of interesting new skill sets. Pretty amazing, actually. But I got bored, so away I went again. I did a postdoc somewhere crazy. I went to Hawaii, so I thought that'd be fun. Um, and continued there, did some writing of books, started a few companies and stuff like that. But always wondering about why, why was I in Hawaii? Like, there's lots of good reasons to be in Hawaii, but it didn't feel right. Um, eventually, uh, I ended up at Carnegie Mellon University doing some things there and started meeting Waterloo people. Dr. Kaysman, Rick Kaysman, many of you know very well, I'm sure, uh, was working with me there. And uh, I met some of his students, all Waterloo, you know, bright, shiny, co-op graduates who wrote software 1,600 million times faster than me. And it was sort of intimidating, but you were like, oh, these are Waterloo people. They're pretty good. I understand that. And around that time, I thought, you know, it's time to start doing something different. And I started forming companies with these people. And Verna came back in the picture. And, but it was all about the Waterloo magic. It was about the shared community, the shared understanding of how to write software, all of the great things done by this program to produce an amazingly high quality software development, particularly the new grads, if I don't, we, we both were grad students, but like the, the undergraduates are absolutely unbelievable. Um, and even when I went to California, I, I, I took a lot of people with me. I came back and got a lot more, came back and got more, came back and got more. And at the end of the day, I think we had eventually moved somewhere around 100 people from here to, to Waterloo. Um, and it was really interesting, but a lot of people wouldn't leave here. They just wouldn't leave. I kept working on the money, you know, career, they just wouldn't go. Uh, Verna was one of these. And so we ended up starting software companies here. And that was a really tur uh, large turning point for me. Are you talking about your best and worst? Oh, oh, yes, my best and worst. Thank you very much. <coughs> right. So the best problem at that time in my life um, was trying to make a computer understand speech in 1998. This was hard, very, very hard. Um, but it was a lot of fun, though. We actually eventually made something that sounded a lot like a broken Siri. Um, even more broken than Siri, I should say. Um, the worst problem was finding these brilliant people willing to take risks. But Waterloo was full of them. And my realization was Waterloo and the Valley were different. In fact, really different. Sufficiently different to matter and maybe make all the difference. And uh, I realized that, that sometimes you needed to leave to see this difference. Um, and sometimes I realized I needed to go home to, be, to go further. And so I came back here uh, to stay in 2008 uh, with Google. And for an interesting reason, because Google, which is full of intelligent and brilliant leaders and founders, they knew this already. And they came to me and said, we know this already. Why don't you go back and do something there? All right. So for me, um, after grad school, I had this amazing opportunity to go to Greece and work on research in high-speed networks, which was right up my alley. Um, and then I came back to Waterloo after a very short period of time. Well, I think it was a year and a bit. Um, so being away taught me a lot of things. It taught me to be flexible, definitely. Um, you know, when you're in a different culture, people do things differently. Um, in Greece, you have to learn a lot of patience. Nothing happens very fast. I once had a prof set up a meeting to do work on a research paper with me at, I think, 4 o'clock, and he showed up at 7, and he couldn't understand why I was upset. Um, so <laughs> he took me out for dinner later at midnight to make up for it. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's how it goes, right? But this diversity of thought, opinion, of backgrounds, of, of how you do things um, is just so eye-opening. And all these differences bring a richness to your life. Uh, they change the way you look at the world, how you react to the world, and even how you solve problems. And so I think um, two years that I spent in Greece, because there was a previous one, um, really are the biggest 
uh, one of the biggest factors in, in making me who I am today, and I think one of the most valuable things I did. But this experience also taught me that um, how important my community is, how much I love Canada, how much I wanted to come home, uh, and how much I couldn't watch hockey in Greece. So uh, why did I come back to Waterloo, though? I could have gone to Saskatchewan, right? Uh, first, as before, it was my family. My family was here by then. Um, second, Canada's my home. I really wanted to come home. And third, it was my career. I knew Waterloo was going to be a place where I could find a great software engineering job. Um, in fact, Johnny tried to get me to come back, offered me a job, and I, and I took him up on it. So um, after working with Johnny for three years, I decided I should get one of these programming jobs and see if I like it. Now, if I'd have taken Robin's course in academia versus academics, I probably would have done this way sooner. Um, so thank you for that course, Robin. Um, but eventually I did it, and, and I loved the programming job. I was like, what am I doing at the university? I love this thing. Um, you know, forgetting to eat lunch, writing code at my desk. Um, so I first went to Sybase, and Sybase had just acquired Whatcom, which probably most people here have heard of. Um, and that's where I first encountered UW co-op students. One term, um, I had four students of my very own working on network protocols, um, and I, th I think I was destined for management as far back as then. Um, then in 1999, uh, I was lured away to Quack uh, by Steve and, and his friends, and um, that was quite a whirlwind for for the first year, then we were acquired by AOL. Um, and then shortly after that, uh, the engineers here decided to move to, to the Silicon Valley. Um, so I went, I went to Silicon Valley for a bit. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a thing everybody should try. Um, and then I came back <laughs> to Waterloo again to be close to my family. But only after only a very brief period of time away, um, it was interesting coming back. And I just, I re it was such a breath of fresh air to be back. And I was trying to figure out why. And it, it was because of the diversity of the people that I know here. Here my friends are from all different backgrounds, from all different professions. I, I have friends in the medical profession, lots of teachers, musicians, actors, everything across the spectrum. And a lot of my friends at the time were also refugee claimants um, from different countries. Um, and in Silicon Valley, everyone I knew studied computer science and was, was fairly you know, entitled and privileged people. So not to say that, that that's the typical Silicon Valley experience. I don't know if it is. But it did show me that I, there were a lot of things in this community that I valued, the richness across many uh, parts of the spectrum. Um, and that's why I wanted to be here as well. Um, so after I got back, uh, I moved to, um, I was recruited to Mitra, um, which uh, was where Rick Strobosher was the CTO. Now Rick Strobosher I had met here at UW when he, I was TAing a course. And uh, two months after that, um, Mitra was acquired by AGFA. So if you're paying attention, um, this is now the third Waterloo startup success story that I stumbled across. And people started saying, I'm going to follow you to the next job because you're going to get acquired by some great company. Um, so I, I, I maybe missed the next one. I'm at Google now. Um, I'm a software engineering manager. Uh, but this is yet another Waterloo startup success story uh, that's interwoven with my own because um, in 2005, uh, Google acquired a Waterloo startup company called Requireless that was started by my friend Roger, who I didn't go work for. Um, but I first met him at the University of Waterloo as well, and he was doing a Master of Mathematics degree. And uh, he also referred me to my first job at Sybase. Um, so there's a lot of startup success stories there in my, in my story. And um, I'm going to go right to my present day. Um, Waterloo is this community with so much to offer and in so many ways my life since undergrad has been, has revolved around the University of Waterloo, university grads, co-op students, faculty and startups in this kind of virtuous cycle that's brought me a lot of success and brought me to where I am in my career today. Um, I've worked at software companies developing database technologies, speech recognition that Steve was talking about, healthcare systems, peer-to-peer -peer networking, uh, online advertising and security. I've been able to do a vast variety of things um, and I love computer science still. But along the way I also learned a lot of things about my own strengths and my passions that have evolved over time as I've allowed kind of these influences to impact who I became in the future. So I'm going to talk about one of my passions um, before I hand it back to Steve. And this was largely fueled uh, by attending the Grace Hopper conference two years ago and being inspired by women like Susan Wojcicki and Sheryl Sandberg and Chelsea Clinton who's an incredible speaker. Um, I've somehow ended up in this profession where there aren't 
very many women and where girls often feel like they don't belong or they, this isn't an option for them. Uh, parents of elementary and high school girls are constantly coming to me and asking me to talk to their daughters about doing a computer science degree um, because they just don't see it as a thing that they want to do or it's just, it's, you know, it's not for them. Um, and this is definitely true of my own nieces. As I watched uh, my nieces grow up, now that they're in their mid-20s, they're finally realizing, oh, Auntie Verna, we should have done a computer science degree. Uh, we'd have such great jobs, and we'd, we'd have such great salaries, and we'd be doing interesting things. Um, hopefully, you know, they can switch uh, careers, but um, when I asked them why they didn't, they just were like, it didn't seem like the thing you would do, right? Um, and when I look at this reality, uh, I'm very thankful for my parents, my friends, my family, my professors who believed that I could do anything and that instilled this belief in me. Uh, I'm also very sad for those girls who, for a variety of subtle reasons, uh, may think that math or science, or especially computer science, is hard or in uninteresting or, or just really uncool. And I really hope there are no more of those advisors out there telling girls that computer science is too hard for them when they get 100% in their grade 12 algebra, right? So. Um, there are some amazing people out there, uh, especially here at the University of Waterloo, who are trying to change all that. Um, I know some social scientists, um, Hilary Burkseeker and Christine Logel, who are trying to understand um, the success and the, the lack of success and representation of women in these male-dominated fields. Uh, Mary Wells in engineering and Joe, who's sitting right there in computer science, who for many years been very tireless in, in, in their quest to try to increase the numbers of women entering programs and staying in them. And I know there are many other people in this room also who have contributed to those efforts. Uh, my very strong belief is that, um, from my own experience, research I've read, research that I've sort of informally done in conversations with all these parents, is that we have a lot of work to do to change um, the perceptions and to break down barriers for Canadian girls and women. Um, both in our universities, obviously, in our, in our schools, elementary schools, high schools, um, and I think we're really at the core of, of our society, in our, our culture, it's very ingrained. Um, one finding that I heard about a couple of weeks ago uh, by a group at UBC, I'm going to just read this, is that women who are both liked and respected by their colleagues score higher on final exams. Who knew that? Um, after I heard this, I was starting to wonder if maybe in my life that was Steve. You know, we, we were joking around, but really, he always thought I was smarter than him, and he tried to get in my, my lab team so that he'd get higher grades. Um, but who knows, maybe the fact that he thought that is the very reason that I got higher grades. Uh, so thank you, Steve. Um, <laughs> so I guess my message here is that we can all play an important role in someone's life. Um, whether we're a faculty member, a parent, a manager, a role model, or even a peer, uh, so many people impacted my life and my success by believing in me, by thinking I could do anything, uh, by encouraging me. And without these people, I don't think I would be here. And I want that to be the case for many more women in Ontario and in Canada, that they can get to the place in their careers that I am. Um, I'd like to say I'm the most senior female software engineer at Google Canada, which is a mouthful, but it's true. Um, and it's kind of sad. I mean, there should be more of us. Um, I'm, I want to show you a couple of graphs that are up there. Um, the one on, uh, with the pink is a graph showing the number of grade 12 students st taking CS classes in Ontario. So the pink is the girls and the blue is the boys. I didn't make this graph. Those wouldn't have been my choices for colors. But in 2015, 12% of the grade 12 students were girls. And at the, a very basic level, this is just like sort of glaring unfairness. But um, it's also, uh, you know, women should have the same opportunities. Um, to succeed in this in this field, and it's a and it's a missed opportunity as well. Um, if men are and women are equally capable, then it then the the fact that women aren't entering this field means that the talent's being misused, um, and we're missing out on on pr productivity that could be there in the in in the 
in the world at large. Um, in April, while I was listening to CBC radio one morning, I heard them say that by 2020, which is not very far away, um, there will be over 200,000 jobs in Canada that we can't fill because there aren't enough people with computer science degrees. Um, so I think if Canada's going to excel in this field uh, and in this space, we need to find a way to get more young people interested in computer science, but especially this large number of women who don't even think it's an option for them, and get them excited that computer science can be interesting and um, is a great career. Um, so on a high note, um, I want to also include a graph from, that Joe sent me this week uh, from the Sheraton School of Computer Science that we are celebrating today. And that is the graph with the blue lines um, showing the female undergraduate enrollment as a percentage from 2006 through last year. So it was at an all-time low in 2010 at 11.9%, um, but since then it's been steadily climbing to 20.3 last year. And Joe also tells me that uh, for the last three years the number of women in the admission cohort has been around 25% and that the percentage of women in cohorts of students transferring in is higher than that. So this has brought the overall percentage to around 22%. Uh, so I think we should actually give a round of applause to the graph and to all those who in this room who are involved in this, um, because I think it's, it's a great accomplishment. And thank you to all of you who have been making this happen. Yeah, I can't you. clap as many. Thank you. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it back to Steve. So today, this is, uh, this is the end. Today, I'm working on a couple of things. Um, I'm working to expand the most innovative and talented technical team in Canada. That's a pretty exciting thing. I believe this is one of the top technical teams ever assembled in industry in Canada. But that's, I'm a little proud, so there's that. Um, I'm trying to find ways for our teams to deliver ever more global impact. It's a very challenging thing at the company I'm at to find things that are worth doing. We're trying to find ways beyond this for every single person in our facility to contribute outside of Google, whether it's in STEM education, diversity, involvement in charitable giving, working on programs to help refugees, whatever it is, I want everybody to be doing that. Because we want to be part of this community in a meaningful way outside of our day-to-day -day work, like so many of you are. Problem two, I'm advocating for investment and advancement nationally in all things tech, in our community, in our province, in our country. I'm putting a lot of time and effort into bringing Google resources, which are significant, into many other areas of, of our uh, ecosystem to help investments in artificial intelligence, investments in research, investments in STEM education. We're going to be doing a lot of interesting things in the coming 12 months. I'm really looking forward to announcing them. <clears throat> we have hard challenges. Verna mentioned diversity. It's a very hard um, problem. On my OKR list, our goals for the year, my number one goal in my job is to change diversity in a very meaningful way. It's very hard, very, very hard. My realization, however, is that from my point of view, my job, my role, that I can continue to leverage Google and make more, include larger investments in the country and make a difference. We can and we are going to do more. I am a proud supporter of this school, uh, the faculty and the university, and I want to just think a little bit about the future. What has been done here has already changed the world, and that's a pretty amazing thing. It's inspired a generation of Canadians, many of them into computer science, math, and STEM education. It's laid the groundwork for an exciting future regionally and nationally, where we're held up as an icon of everything that's good about computer science. It's an unbelievable responsibility. I had a chance to talk to some of my peers in the community and abroad, um, all with ties to the university, about their thoughts uh, about the future and how the University of Waterloo can, can assist. Um, so some of these thoughts refle are reflected in what I'm about to say. <clears throat> I think as we look to how industry and academia uh, here can collaborate uh, to great effect and, and help our community research uh, reach its tremendous potential, there's a couple of very hard challenges. I picked two. The first is I think we should figure out how to not hoard the magic. It's really hard. Waterloo has created magic. Google created magic. Silicon Valley has created magic. The community of Waterloo has created magic. People are always asking, always, always asking, how can we make insert town here like Waterloo. And I tell them all the same thing. You can. You simply can. Right? Find your own magic. But Waterloo has its magic and somehow it needs to find a way to help the others. The magic of producing computer science graduates who come out with a, a, ma a tremendously grounded um, academic view of computer science plus 
this idea of having an enormous industry capacity is absolutely set this university at the forefront of computer science in the world. It needs to be expanded across the country. We have to help the government understand the need to further radically increase investment in math and computer science in Canada. I was recently talking to someone very senior in the federal government who was talking about their billion dollar investment and how excited they were and I basically told them, as you would, it's a good start, but not nearly enough. I had a chance to talk to Steve Blank, a historian of Silicon Valley, who pointed out that in the early days of Silicon Valley, they invested roughly 27 times that. We're getting started. We have to help students understand. This is a big one. We have to help students understand what computer science is and why it matters. We have to connect what they can build to what they need to study. <clears throat> Far too many Canadians, young Canadians, their parents and their educators do not understand how the children in their care can be empowered and encouraged to shape their own futures. They don't understand how mathematicians can create machines that learn. Frankly, I don't, but that's to start there. <clears throat> they, don't know how, they don't understand how to connect their tedious high school math courses with a future where cancer is diagnosed quickly and lives are saved. They don't understand that investing time and energy in creating interactive worlds in Minecraft and sharing and involving those with collaboratively with other children could lead to an inspired future where cities operate differently, more cleanly, and serve better people. They don't understand how teams can be assembled collaboratively to deliver the next worldwide information service to six billion people. They don't understand that innovation and invention, building, disrupting, using software is a social endeavor. This is important. They don't understand that when one is surrounded by amazing, talented, fun, and compassionate individuals, that going to work is a fun thing. We have to, we are all ob obligated to make this better. This faculty and this amazing institution has done much to reach out, but it's not enough. The same is true for industry, it's not enough by far. You are the leaders, we are the leaders, you are the creators. You should and have to step up. Take a stronger role in advocating to children, schools, teachers, parents, and government. Convince them with your passion for research, for development, for quality. Convince them that they should aspire to be software developers, engineers, and the makers of their own future. The best problem I've worked on in the last couple of years is connecting our youth with math and software in a meaningful way. The hardest challenge I've had is to make computer science attractive to everyone. My realization is that people care about their impacts in their lives and working with others to solve problems. Computer science needs to be seen as a desirable path forward to building a better world. That's just part one. <laughs> part two. I know, it's the wrong slide. It's all right. I thought you were going to talk. I wasn't looking. I probably did it backwards. <laughs> Have I got the right one? Yep, got the right one. All right. Um, monkeys, remember? It's monkeys. In the last 10 years, at least 10 times as much finance capital is being invested annually in this community. It's almost an unbelievable amount of money. The amount of jobs created is, is un, unprecedented in our, in our province, in our, in our community. There have, however, been more than 2,500 open software engineering jobs in town year over year for the last five years increasing annually. It's projected to be 5,500 by 2020, nearly 12 times as many in Toronto. The student populations in computer science in Ontario, Canada, and Waterloo cannot begin to pace this growth and are not pacing this growth. The opportunity Verna mentioned to increase diversity is a major untapped resource that we have to do something about, but it's still not going to be enough. As was mentioned before, the future will be built first by people in software and increasingly by software and software inspired by human insight and invention. What do we want these children to learn in schools? It's not clear. We need you to lead the way in telling us. It's a hard question. I was asked recently by my school, what should my, I have a 10-year-old daughter, and they asked me what will the world look like when she graduates. I haven't got the slightest idea. That's a long time, seven years. Seven, eight years. It's impossible to know. What should we be teaching these children? The teachers don't know. The brilliant minds that can change the entire world and who will set this school and our country up for success need to be found, encouraged, nurtured, nurtured continuously and supported. We have to find more. We have to find more and, and uh, we have to have more immigration. The people we need um, are going to be people that will fuse academic excellence, a research mindset and a builder's passion. It's something that Univ University of Waterloo grad undergraduates deliver like nowhere else. This is an astounding fact and sets us all apart at this school. However, far, far too, too many of these minds, these amazing minds, educated and nurtured at this institution, depart never to return. Our country's future and economic growth through technology will depend on more of these people staying here. More people coming here, 
and more people staying here. We have to come together to ensure that they stay, prosper, and expand on the efforts of those before to make this an attractor for yet more. We are far, far too Canadian in our failure to trump out our own successes and our advantages. We must explain clearly, Waterloo and Ontario and Canada deliver everything a top performer could want. A community in which to be challenged, a community in which to build success collaboratively, and to live healthy lives. I look very much forward to continuing to work with all of you in building this. Thank you. Are there any questions? Kesha. Oh, Kesha. Do we want to train more monkeys to put in cages? I think we mostly want female monkeys. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> do you want to answer that? Do you mean as Google? Or do you? He means what do we want them to learn? So you're asking how we can shrink the number of computer science grads in the world to do even better things. I guess so. Yeah. So, so. You know, that wasn't my thesis, so I'm not sure how to get there. David might know. Well, I think what I was trying to allude to, I, I didn't have a preview of, of David's really cool talk um, where I would have changed things. I said that to Vernon before we got up here. But um, I mean, I think the question that I've been talking to, to teachers about is like, well, what is it that we want people to learn? Um, and I do think that no matter what computer science is, and it's certainly different than it was, although it's a challenge to that maybe, um, is that it will be something different in 10 years and it will be something more different in 10 years. And certainly the creativity that we see in our work um, is different now. It's expressed differently, certainly. And what can be accomplished, you know, with scale, things change. I mean, 10 times, is, it's not just quantitatively 10 times. It's much different. So I think creativity is a big part. It's why I alluded to the Minecraft aspects in, for children. I think the idea that we've been talking for years about building a Minecraft where people could program, and then of course it just appeared because someone did it with uh, Tingle or whatever it was. And so now you can. And so now you have children building software. Um, but they don't really need to know that they're building software. They need that they're using machines to accomplish things and invent things and the, the scientific method into their lives. So I think that's the kind of skills we need. And I think computer science teaches people very logical and rigorous thought. So if nothing else, we have that. I think there's still a tremendous amount to be done, and there's a lot of very interesting challenges. I think the message I was trying to get across is not that we're in imminent danger of, of becoming irrelevant, but that we just simply have to recognize what, what our limitations are and what the important skill sets. And I think that I think computer programming might be viewed as shifting more to uh, experimental activity rather than a sheer intellectual Ernest Hemingway composition activity. But we still need a lot of people to, to get where we're going. And I think if you look at the aircraft industry, I mean, it went through an incredible boom after World War II and a lot of people involved. And maybe it leveled off a certain amount, but you wouldn't want to cut back too early here. And we can't predict when we'll be cutting back, if ever. If I could echo one thing that, that David said in his talk as well, though, um, if I could, you know, influence what maybe one thing the University of Waterloo does in its teaching, um, that learning to, to be able to understand large systems or work with large systems or being able to walk into ambiguity and make some progress and being comfortable with not understanding everything and still getting something done is a massive skill that we are missing in the industry. Um, my manager has said to me, I can't tell you how many times in the last week, but you're okay with ambiguity. 
Like he sees this as like I think my number one strength, and um, it's just something that's that that doesn't naturally happen when you're when you're learning in the classroom and when you're starting to write code with a blank slate, right? You need like at least a million lines of code in front of you that's really broken before you can start experiencing this. And we work at a company that values experimentation maybe just to an unbelievable degree, um, and have built enormous infrastructures to support that. And I guess that's an example of what you're saying. One last question. Dave. So you said that Canada and Ontario is not growing as fast as for computer scientists. The simple fact of the matter is our, there's way more demand than we have capacity for. I was just at the Ontario University Fair where I had to tell a lot of students who might have had their heart on going to the University of Waterloo yep. that based on their high school grades, they're probably not going to make it. So how do we how do we grow or how does Ontario grow or how does Canada grow when we're already hitting our capacity? And you yeah. you said one of your main motivations is to get more people excited about it. The capacity may not be there. It's a tremendous question. I had to tell my daughter the thing you just talked about that her math grades weren't good enough to go to this university. So I sent her to Saskatchewan. <laughs> <laughs> but so I went out to Saskatchewan earlier this year to talk to their faculty. And they are graduating 68 computer scientists a year. Now that is definitely not enough. It's not enough for Saskatoon. And so we have to radically expand. And we have to radically expand immigration. There's a, sorry, I'm sorry, can I just? Yeah, I just, yeah, go. Finish. Okay, I was gonna say, I, there's a venture capitalist in Canada uh, who I don't wanna name, but like, he is advocating very forcibly with the federal government that they should bring in a million computer scientists. A million. And our new visa programs typically might support this. There's another politician that's advocating that we bring in all of the DACA computer scientists who've graduated immediately. So I think these kind of radical things, some of which might cause some problems, um, need to be contemplated. Otherwise, we just won't be able to compete. So what I was going to say is that um, one of the one of the programs that we use at Google to diversify our intern uh, pool is uh, we go look at universities that typically we don't hire from that have like I don't who here has read David and Goliath? Okay, not the biblical story, but the book by Malcolm Gladwell. Um, I think we from that from that book. What did I glean from that book? People at you know, universities with lower standards are actually pretty smart. Um, so uh, we've, we started recruiting from a bunch of different universities that we normally wouldn't. Um, and we're trying to just get at a diverse population. And you know what? Those co-op students were also, well, we call them interns, but they weren't doing UW co-op, but they were also amazing. Um, and, uh, and we got this much more diverse group, right? And we got all kinds of people that would never have come to Google in, a, in some other way. Um, and so I think, um, I, I don't know if I'm advocating for, for lowering standards. Uh, I, I'm advocating for thinking about how, like, I don't know if my math grades were indicative of how well I would do it in computer science, maybe, but there are other things that might also be really good um, indicators of somebody that would do well in this, right? Like, ability to handle ambiguity. <laughs> like, I don't know, right? But um, I think there are, that there are a lot more people who are capable of computer science um, than meet the bar maybe here. And, and so we can, uh, we can get them from all over the place. We just have to expand programs. May I say one more thing to that? Like, so I think, and I've been talking to a lot of companies as well. Like we, Google, we're very lucky. We have many resources, many amazing people in different areas from education um, at every level to, to uh, people who understand how to train. So we've been reaching out and we're doing our own training. The program Vern has talked about is you know, we're actually basically running a fourth year computer science program you know, and something like a mini UW co-op program for these people. That's what we're doing. Like we're, we're just taking the things that you've all done so well and trying to roll them up into a six month program and then make them into interns, then graduate them into the population. But the point is we are doing it inside. And so we've run a program. We've actually done one of these in a local community college where we've tried to see if it would work. We're gonna do more experiments like that. Um, to see if we can take people who already have some computer science brown, background and make them industrial computer scientists. Um, whether we can take people who are scientists in other areas and make them computer scientists. 
So, I mean, there's been some success with that at other universities as well. So, that's another thing. I think companies have forgotten how to build their own experts. Yeah, I think with that, we're going to thank, we're going to have to thank the speakers. Thank you.